Okay, here we are on take three. <laughs> We've had a little bit of communication problem here, uh, but I think we're okay now. Can anybody see me? Yeah. Are we good? Uh, just let me know. We're going to finish whether, whether it's on there or not. Okay, again, if you're on there listening with us, we're glad to have you. We're in 1 John chapter 1. We just talked about the time setting uh, during this time of Scripture that the church was being harassed in a sense, and there were some folks that had gone out uh, that were ministering some other doctrines and letting down some things, and uh, they were being blessed, it looked like. So the church was being a little bit shaken, uh, wondering if they were okay and on the right path. So in all this, listen, we still come down to this. John is saying that which we heard from the beginning, uh, which we've heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. The word of life. I kind of titled this tonight that the God we serve is the God of life and the God of light. When we talk about this scripture, what they saw, the word of life, remember in him there's no death. The Bible says the last enemy to be put away is death. And the Lord's going to take care of all of this on all of our behalf. So that which was from the beginning, he's saying to the church, listen to me. Remember what you heard from the beginning. The very foundation stones of the gospel. Don't be drawn off into these other things that somebody says now, well, you can baptize this way or you can baptize whenever. Pretty soon they'll be saying like the Mormons say about this baptism and so on, that you're remarried and you're this and you're that and various things. Everybody's going to try to come in such a unity. They're going to omit the gospel and the teaching and what was from the beginning. What we have heard, he heard from Jesus himself. And now he's saying, pay attention to what we have heard. Because I'm saying I've heard what I'm telling you, as John would say. And pay attention and stay in that. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes. Again, they saw the Christ, the Messiah, the laying on of hands. They saw the dead raised. They saw lame people walk. They saw people that couldn't see from birth whose eyes were opened. That which we have seen, the word of life, you're suffering, you're struggling, you're living like I'm a dead person. I feel like there's no life in me. And Christ is the life. Amen. And he wants to come into every one of our lives, but we have to allow that which we have looked upon in our hands of handled of the word of life, the power of this gospel. Remember last Sunday I said, listen, don't forget, we were dead in trespasses and sin. When you came to Jesus, you were resurrected from that. And life came into you. Life came into me. When you think about John, who when the Bible talks about at that Passover dinner, that last supper, having his head against Jesus' breast. And again, what's with Peter that Peter says, well, Jesus, what about him? Focusing on John. And here's John writing to us. It says, for the life was manifested. Everything that God wants in us was in Christ. Remember, he was to be called Jesus. Call his name Emmanuel. Jesus' salvation, Yeshua, Emmanuel, God with us. Call his name because remember, he took on flesh and blood. Amen. But the Bible tells us in Corinthians, he was God reconciling us unto himself. All the confusion about are there three gods that we worship? How do we define all this? Hey, listen, if you don't understand any of that, serve him anyway. Love him anyway. He was God in the flesh. I and my father are one, he said. The life was manifested. 
And we have seen it. The life that God ordained for men was manifest in Jesus. And they have seen it, it says. And bear witness. We can tell you how anything that he touched would come to life if there was death. Unclean things were made clean by the touch of his hand. Devils, where they found dark places in people's lives, had to come out. We bear witness and show unto you that that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. He's saying Jesus, whoever was and ever will be, was manifested to us. Verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. Listen, I say all the time to people, I don't, I, I'm sorry what you heard, but I can tell you what I see. I can tell you what I observed in ministry or church or how somebody's healed and what happens in somebody's life. Hey, you hear all kinds of things from all kinds of people with all kinds of motives. You go check why would they say what they say. A lot of times you'll find dirty deeds in the background. But what have you seen? What have you heard? What's been manifest right in the midst of us? This is why we should be full of joy. We'll get to the scripture here in another part where it talks about that your joy may be full. He says, that's why I've told you all these things. Back there in John 15, Jesus said, I've said all this so that your joy may be full. We're to have the joy of the Lord in us. So that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. So if somebody says, well, did you hear this? Did you hear that? I can't attest to that. I can only attest to what I've seen and heard of the Lord and where we are. That ye may also, or ye also, may have fellowship with us. Listen, if somebody's out there listening and Christ isn't Lord and Savior of their lives, how many people have we tried to embrace and said, listen, all we want to tell you is this is what God did for us. This is what God will do for you. God healed them. God restored them. God changed their life. God delivered them. God delivered me. God changed my life. I'm a testimony. Amen. It's what he's saying here. You're shaken in your belief out there because some church said you don't have to do this anymore. And some big guy on the stage said, well, God never required that. And then the one group of people says, well, that might have been wrong all the way along. And that's what he's saying to the congregation here. Come on back to what you've heard from the beginning. I'm testifying to you from what we saw, what we heard, what we took part of with the Lord when he was here. So that you may have true fellowship with us or that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father. Again, we're not a social organization where we just gather together. We know when we come together, the Lord is with us. Amen. Because he dwells in every one of us by faith, right? Amen. We study to show ourselves approved. We seek the Lord. Uh, we want to be, as Jesus prayed, one with the Father as he and the Father were, were one in John chapter 17. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Full means complete. Full means abounding. When it's complete, it's abounding, and you can't contain it all because it's going to come out. He says that your joy may be full. Jesus, again, I think it's in John chapter 15, uh, said, you know, these things I've told you that your joy might be full. God wants us to be a testimony and full of the goodness of God. This then is the message which we have heard of him. John's repeating what Christ taught and sticking to that. These others may go off in other things, but listen, if we're reading it out of the scripture, we're reading what Jesus said. 
in the red letters and in the other letters, we're reading what the disciples heard of him, what they're teaching of him. In some places, yes, it's a, uh, you know, a, a friendly greeting and so on. It's a friendly closing. You know, they're saying, we love you. We're praying for you. We thank God for you and so on. There's a lot of that through the scriptures. Uh, consolation in many places. And what they would, that we would do who hear the word and follow and what the churches they were ministering to. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full, complete and abounding. This then is the message which we have heard of him. So we didn't come up with this on our own. Remember, that's in the scripture also. And these aren't things that we've contrived of men, they said. These things we've heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I got to tell you, while I was reading this over again, I was reading it the other day. That's why I said Sunday about uh, going there tonight because we didn't get there. God is light. And I printed out my notes. I don't know where I put them, but... I wrote in here in Revelation, it talks about being the light of the temple or the light of the city, not the temple, because he says there's no need of the, of the temple, but he's the light of it all. And so it says here that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. When we're in the kingdom of God, we don't have to fear that there's any evil whatsoever because evil is always a part of darkness. And there will be no darkness whatsoever. Death represents darkness. There'll be no death whatsoever. God is light, he says. And in him is no darkness at all. You remember in the scripture when Jesus went up to the Mount of Transfiguration and he was transfigured, right? They said that his clothes were lightened. He was bright. He was like shining was the glory of God. Remember when Moses came down from the mountain because of the glory that he was in the presence of the Lord there, they had to put a veil over his face because the people couldn't stand it. And we're talking about the one who caused all that, the light of glory himself. When we say that God is light and God is life, he's the light of the city, New Jerusalem, to where there's no need of a temple whatsoever. There's no ritualism whatsoever. There's no following in this footstep and that footstep and this thing and that thing. There's none of that because we're in the presence of the one who ordained and created it all. Amen. The presence of the Lord. God is light. When Jesus comes, what's the Bible say in Revelation? It talks about, or not in Revelation... Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it refers to three different times that he's going to come in the clouds with glory. But in two places it says with great glory. In other words, we don't understand this as yet. When we talk about light and we talk about glory, we see a little bit of the glory, a little bit of the light with Moses, and some of it even more so with Jesus because he was God and God was well pleased with him and he obeyed God to the fullest. But we're going to see glory in the fullest. When Jesus descends out of heaven with great glory, it says, we're talking about light from the kingdom of God. However far up that is, we're talking light from there that's coming down as the Son of God to end all this darkness. Remember, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2, darkness will cover the face of the earth. But then it goes on to talk about the glory that God's going to manifest. The earth is going to be corrupt. Sodom and Gomorrah will look like a picnic compared to what's going to be going on in the world. The darkness, the sin, the wickedness, the evil... All these things. And the light of the Lord. The light of his glory. 
the light of Jesus is going to be manifest. When we talk about the earth separating the Mount of Olives down through the old city of Jerusalem, the gate being broken open, what are we talking about? What causes that? Light hitting the earth, the light of God, the fullness of God being manifest. Think about this. When he's writing all this here, remember, he was with Jesus. We say, oh, if I was only with Jesus, everything would be wonderful. Well, we're where we are. He says we're more blessed because we're doing all this having not seen him. And they were with him. They touched him. They ate with him. Uh, you know, they slept in places maybe near him, whatever. They walked with him. They beheld him. They saw, they heard, they observed. You and I are believing all this because the Spirit of God has touched our hearts and changed us and resurrection lifted us up out of the dead and put us in Christ, translated us into the kingdom of His Son. Think about how miraculous this is. And here we are fighting to try to get people in church. If they understood that the fellowship you and I have in the body of Christ is with the Father and with the Son and not just us people with faces and bodies and personalities, the flesh we talked about Sunday, but then Jesus is no longer in the flesh because he could have never ascended to heaven. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. And he's inherited the kingdom. Think about how real this all is and how full it is. And we're trying to get across to people that really don't understand, but sometimes don't even want to understand. Sort of like that, I think it says in the scripture, a willful, willful ignorance concerning creation and concerning the Lord. Man, Lord have mercy. If we could only understand what we're talking about, what we're looking for, uh, we're going to be with him when he comes, the Bible says. So you don't have to fear that whatsoever. Whenever he catches us up in the air, he's going to catch us up. The dead are going to come out of the graves. Another resurrection. And we're going to be with the Lord when he comes in all this. What's the glory going to be like with us as we're coming back with him? Think about it. I know, does that stir you up at all? It should. It should start to make you think again like, wow, what should I be doing in the Lord? This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, God is light. They're preaching what they heard preached to them as Jesus stood places and ministered to them and preached to the multitudes out there. And in him is no darkness at all. Darkness is what causes us to lie. Darkness is what causes us to not tell the full truth or not tell the rest of the story. There's none of that in the Lord. He tells us everything. The only thing he held back is when he's coming. That Jesus himself said, I don't even know to tell you that that's with my father. Verse 6 says, if we say that we have fellowship with him. Anybody have fellowship with the Lord? Amen. Yeah? I don't hear you too much, but <laughs> anyone who says he has fellowship with him and walk in darkness, or if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. Listen, you and I are walking in the Lord, right? Amen. So we're walking in the light. Amen. If somebody says that I am in the fellowship with him and they are walking in darkness, it means they're not in the light of the gospel. They're not in the light of Christ. They're not living the right, the godly life. They're living the other life as so many folks we know who said, well, yeah, I want Jesus, but I'm not giving this up. Remember we talked about the cost compared to the value of a thing? 
You may pay a hundred bucks for something and get it home and find out it's worth two thousand dollars. Cost versus value. Cost us a little bit in life what we go through to serve the Lord and follow and, and hang in here compared to the value of that glory when Jesus for the glory set before him would endure the cross? What did he know? He was with the Father. He was from heaven. He's seen it all. He knew it all. And he knew it was worth the value, was worth that little bit it cost him by just laying down his life for all of us. Think about that. So if we say we have fellowship with him, and listen, everybody out there listening, most of our folks here, I'm sure they're just fine in the Lord. Maybe they're checking themselves right now, which is a good thing. If you say you have fellowship with Jesus, if you say you are in fellowship with him, you say he's my Lord too, he's my Savior too. Well, the Bible says that if you're still walking in darkness, living the lifestyle of darkness, hanging out in the places of darkness, fellowshipping more with the people of darkness than the people of light. The Bible says you lie. Now, it may be that you're deceived, and so you think you're actually speaking the truth. But it says we lie and do not the truth. And if we address everybody with this, there'll be no more of this simple ask Jesus into your life and everything's wonderful because that's just the beginning stage. And then we've got to take everybody through all the rest. He says in verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, all kinds of things go on in the darkness. With my notes, wherever they are, I looked up, why did the Amish people hang their clothes outside in the sun? To dry. Well, to dry. But what do you know about what happens with the sun? Ultraviolet rays of the sun kill the bacteria in your towels, in your undergarments, and all those kind of things that your washer and dryer can't touch. Amen. There's nothing there to kill all that. I mean, the heat, high heat can do some damage, but not like the rays of the sun. You can sit in a lot of things and have a lot of nice things done to you and said to you and so on, like we talked about a chiropractor and adjustments. Uh, you can throw your clothes in the washer and the dryer and you look at them and you figure they're clean. I still remember a John Tesh uh, program that he did. I don't know if that is even around anymore, but he talked about undergarments and what's in your undergarments when you throw them in the washing machine and the dryer gets in the rest of your clothes. So I don't know if you took an ultraviolet nut light and shined it on there. You might see some things that you don't like. And that's what goes on with a lot of stuff out here with psychology, psychiatry, transcendental meditation, positive thinking. You see, it may look pretty good right now, but when that ultraviolet type light, the glory of the Father comes down from heaven, everything's exposed. And it ain't going to look good. If we walk in the light, no matter where you've been in life, no matter when you said you made that decision, you better get walking in the light. As he is in the light, we're talking about the glory of God. Who's in the glory of God but Jesus and the Father? And he's saying that we better be in that light we could call it the ultraviolet light just to say we can understand and see a difference. If we, have, if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. Why? Because we're all clinging to the light. We're all like those 
moths or whatever bugs are out there and the light's on and we're all getting as close to the light as we can. We're bumping into each other. We're, you know, sometimes maybe we, my wing slaps you in the face. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Listen, our sin's exposed, but we're being cleansed from our sin because the ultraviolet light, because we're being drawn to the light, because we're all in the light. We're in fellowship with one another, and we remember that our fellowship is not just amongst ourselves, but it's with the Father and with His Son. If we say we have no sin, of course, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There are people today professing that now that I say I believe in Jesus, I don't have any sin. I can't sin. No, you're wrong. He said, if you say you have no sin, you're wrong. We deceive ourselves. You're believing something you shouldn't believe because now you don't feel like you need to repent before God, which puts you in a place that you're not humble. You're not meek. You're not submissive. You may be in other areas, but in that you're not. So let's jump over to, it goes on to talk about confessing our sins and so on. Um, and if we sin, of course, in the beginning of chapter 2 there, and then in 2.2 2 of uh, 1 John, it says that he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He died and took the place for the sin of all the world. Amen. But us who believe on him and receive his forgiveness and his mercy, receive the work of the cross, we're the ones that are blessed by it. Uh, and hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Those 10 commandments back there, again, are still required to every one of us, even though Jesus has stood in our place, we're to keep the commandments. He that, uh, in verse 6, it says that he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Now listen, we all may make it into the kingdom, but if we say, have I walked the way Jesus walked? Have I prayed with people who are sick? Have I gone out to some people? Have I, uh, you know, ministered to some of the weary and the beaten down? And have I uh, made provision for them like Jesus who multiplied the loaves and the fishes, various things? How have we walked after his walking? How have we fulfilled that? It's a question we've all got to look at and ask ourselves. Otherwise, it's very easy to fall into, well, I sit in church, I go home, I look at my Bible every so often, I say, Lord, bless my family, but are we walking as he walked? And then he goes on to say, I don't write new commandment to you, but a new commandment I give to you, which thing is true in him and in you, in verse 8, because the darkness is past refers to the darkness is now passing away because we're getting closer and closer to the light. The light coming, the light being revealed in its fullness. The darkness is past and the true light now shineth. It's the glory of God working in every one of our lives. He said there'll be glory that will cover the earth. There'll be glory in the church by Jesus Christ. Listen, when the church goes through some tough times, just remember, the Lord is faithful to the church, praying that we'll be faithful to him, right? Amen. The darkness is past, the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, again, in the light. And then he goes on and talks about not loving your brethren and so on. Verse 10, he says, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light. Listen, 
Our brother is not just people in our congregation. It'll, it is people who keep the commandments, people who live the life, people who walk as he walked wherever they are. They're our brethren. Amen. Uh, jump down to uh, verse 12, which I think is a great thing for all of us. And if we ended right here, we could end right here. Verse 12 says, I write unto you. Now remember, he said, um, he wrote these things that your joy may be full. Jesus said in John 15, I say these things that your joy may be full. Verse 12, he says, I write unto you. He's, he's writing in so many things here. He's coming up with other areas like, this is why I'm writing to you. When you're trying to convince your loved ones you know, that you love them. Listen, this is why I've done all this for you. This is why I keep coming back to you with these things. Uh, this is why I want you to understand. This is what he's saying here. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Remember, you and I weren't forgiven because we deserved it. Amen. We weren't forgiven because... We decided one day, uh, and here's what a lot of folks are saying now, because the word repent means change of mind, which it does in the Greek. But they're leaving out the places in um, Hebrews uh, 6 where it talks about repentance, repentance unto God. In other words, I don't just change my mind in the sense that, well, I don't want to be a drunk or drunkard or drinker like I was before, and I stopped drinking, and now I'm right with God. No. There's got to be a lot of clarity in terminology. When your mind changes that I don't want to live like this anymore, it's because, it's got to be because there's been a heart change. That's the only way it manifests itself. But that heart change has got to be because, God, I now see that I was a sinner, even though I said I have no sin. I was deceived. I see that I'm a sinner, and I need the blood of Jesus and the fellowship of the saints to cleanse me. I need that propitiation work to have effect in my life. Turning to God. Repentance unto God. It talks about turning to the living God. Abstaining from these things. That mind, cha mind change is in agreement with other things that I don't want to be here anymore. That young man we talk about, we call him the prodigal son. He was out there. He had a mind change, but in his mind change... He came back and said, I have sinned. That's where the love of God comes in and forgiveness totally fills somebody's heart. Amen. Little children, he says, I write unto you because your sins are forgiven. Uh, let me see. I remember this in uh, 6, 11. 1 Corinthians 6.11. You'll remember this because he talked about the various areas of sin that would keep people from going to heaven. And then he said in verse 11, And such were some of you. Every one of you was either an adulterer, a liar, a fornicator, effeminate, abuser, idolater, uh, Adulterer, did I say that? A thief, covetous, drunkard, reviler, extortioner. He said, none of you will enter the kingdom. But then he said, but, and such were some of you, but you're washed. You're sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of of all God, our God. And then he says from that point on, all things 
now are of God. You say, well, how can all things be of God? Because he said, whatever comes our way, all things will work to our good, right? Because we love him, because we're called, because we're washed, because we're justified. So whatever comes our way now is of God because the devil can't manifest anything unless God allows it. Amen. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake so that we will be fully able to give God all the glory for what he has done in our lives that we're not dead in trespasses and sin. We're not at the end, other end of that light of glory that's going to come in the book of Revelation. We are with the light. We're in the light. We have fellowship with the light that's coming in the end, the light of Christ, the light of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you for this night and give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for this little bit of the word. And I just pray this stirs us up and stirs other up, others up, Lord God. I also pray, Father, that you convict every one of us and everyone listening in tonight, anybody that will hear this message, that, Lord, they just need to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Father, they need to acknowledge their sin, repent, change their mind, but change the lifestyle. Let the Lord let you work in their hearts and minds. Be born again. We were born into a new lifestyle, a new way, a new way of thinking, a new fellowship. We were born into all of this. And we thank you for that tonight. Pray that you'll find that also. Uh, you may have had some religious training, some church background, may read your Bible quite a bit and all these things. But listen, when Christ comes into your life, the light of the gospel will lighten you and you will understand better and more clear because you will receive a portion of the Holy Spirit to help you along the way till you receive the fullness of the Spirit that the Bible tells us it's the fullness of the Spirit for us here, but it's only the deposit or down payment of what he has for us. Pray that God bless you in all that. Go forth in the Lord. Amen. Amen. We weren't even on, were we? Oh, we were? Okay. Well, I don't find any way here to shut it off. Or Oh, we did the phone again. Hey, thanks for being with us.